All is well, all is at ease. That is what they are telling us. And of course, as uh, Samagina has talked about, this is the man that has supposedly elicited the rift between these two very important organizations in the administration of justice. But let's just try and understand the roles of them, all of the politics and fluff aside. So the roles of the DPP, what are they? And we'll get to the DCI in a moment. And it starts off with taking a look at what it says in the ODPP Act. Section 5, which says, pursuant to Article 157, and we'll get to that article in the Constitution, it says the role of the DPP is to institute and undertake criminal proceedings against any person, of course, other than a court-martial, in respect of any offense alleged to have been committed. Now, that article of the Constitution, 157, Part 4, says the Director of Prosecutions shall have the power to direct the Inspector General of the National Police and by extension the DCI to investigate any information and that the Inspector General shall comply with such direction. So um, what about, uh, this is another important one and this is the one that talks about the DPP requiring no consent from any person or authority to commence any criminal proceedings. Now this is important, we'll come back to this, just saying that the buck completely stops with the DPP when it comes to prosecutions. But what about the DCI? Well, to find the roles, you'd have to check in the National Police Service Act of 2011 that says their role, particularly of the DCI, is to investigate serious crimes, the wide range of crimes from narcotics, human trafficking, terrorism, economic crimes, or corruption, if you like. And it also says just like we saw in Article 157, that they can do these investigations on their own or under the direction given to them by the Director of Public Prosecutions. That is all in Article 157. So what many people tell me is it's a relay race. The DCI investigates and then gets evidence and recommends charges. Those recommendations are not binding in law. He then hands over the baton to the DPP, exits the scene. It is the DPP now who takes a look at the evidence that has been presented together with the recommendations. He would then approve the charges, in which case he would then frame the charge sheet, present that in court, or he could reject it altogether. And like we said, he answers to no other authority or does not require the consent of any other person in doing this. So now you've seen it's a relay race rather than a marathon. So they don't run together. They have independent but separate roles that are complementary. So to recap, the DCI, what they do is they recommend charges. Once it goes to the DPP, the DPP is solely responsible for deciding whether to put charges or place charges in court against a suspect or not. So they then frame them and prefer the charges. And they have a list uh, of rules subject to evidence. They assess um, these, uh, the evidence that is presented to them, whether they meet the threshold of a certain criteria. The main one being, does it serve public interest? Does prosecuting an individual serve the wider administration of justice? They take a look at all of the evidence that has been presented. And the most important is whether there's a reasonable prospect of conviction. They'll take a look at the quality of the evidence, the credibility of the witnesses, whether they have expert evidence, maybe it could be medical evidence, could be physical evidence. They have a lot to take into account. Now here is where the differences come in. Not every investigation is prosecuted. Also, the charge sheet that is filed in court, a copy is given to the police to effect an arrest. An arrest. If the arrest has already happened, usually um, they will be presented in court to hear the charges that have been framed by the prosecutor. Now, the way we said the DCI, not all of the investigations that they have will lead to prosecution. This could be for a number of reasons. The, DC, the DPP can choose... Um, to go after some suspects, not all. They could choose an out-of-court settlement like what we saw today with the banks choosing, instead of prosecuting the bank officials, to charge them a penalty of over 300 million shillings. Or they could decide in the case of a murder to go for an inquest rather than a murder charge. On the other hand, the DPP, because it is their sole responsibility to prosecute, cannot then take the decision to prosecute and say the evidence given to them by the DCI was defective they are usually supposed to have considered all of that in making the decision. This is how we conclude. When there is success in terms of conviction, the success between the DCI and the DPP is shared. Good evidence, good prosecution. When there is failure, 
the DPP is the one that would take the blame for that. So that is exactly how it works. And if you recall, we're asking you today because they said all is well. Do you believe them when they say that they are reading from the same script? The hashtag, the explainer, SMS us, 22422, or you can send us a tweet. Uh, here is one, Joel Mulwa says, it's clear that there is miscommunication between the DCI and the DPP. How can a charge sheet miss, miss in a crucial case? Rushing to the media too is wrong. Give the court its work. One last one, Mali Mukatebe says, it's not all rosy. They just came to save face. The difference says in a court case involving a big scandal in Kenya was embarrassing. They must be regretting why it happened before the public. There is so much more of your feedback. Remember to use the hashtag the explainer for your chance to get your feedback heard here on the show. That's